Okay, it is just after 9.30. I think we are going to make a start now. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Folerik Behai. I'm your main host for today. And I'm joined by my two colleagues, Debbie and Emma, who are going to take various sections here. Um, I'll leave them to introduce themselves when they actually start their bits. But essentially, today is all about post-pandemic ways of working in higher education. We've called it Roots to Success. Um, let's just see there. I don't think we are there yet. So I kind of keep on thinking of myself in the car at the front driving along and the kids are saying, are we there yet? And I'm saying, no, we're not. Um, but we will get there at some point. So this is a learning session for all of us, really. And you'll see that as we go through the session. So I'm just going to move on. Uh, a little bit here around housekeeping. Um, like I said to some of you as you were coming in, your videos are enabled, but for this part, this part of the session, if you just keep them off and keep yourself on mute if you're not talking, um, it is better for you, for especially to engage in the chat if you're not on full screen in, in, in Zoom. So if you take yourself off full screen so that you can see the chat and um, you'll be able to participate. We will, throughout this session, be engaging in the chat and we want you to, you know, just put your thoughts in as we're going through so that it's not just us talking to you. As I said, we are not there yet in terms of post-pandemic ways of working, so we've got a lot to learn from each other. Slide, okay. So um, just before I start then, just looking at this slide, all this tells you is that SUMS is made up of three distinct areas. We've got um, SUPC, our sister um, team there, and we've got SUMS Consulting. And collectively, we have a really big presence across the HE sector. The reason you're here today is because we've worked with you and continuing to work with you. And it's just about influencing and supporting the sector to achieve continuous improvement across, across procurement, across consulting, lots of reviews we've carried out within in the sector and it's really just nice to kind of see you all here today. So what are we going to be looking at? Um, we are looking at some research that has been uh, taking place around post-pandemic ways of working. My colleague Debbie is going to come into the picture very soon to talk about that. We actually did start talking about a number of themes. Now here, there are lots of themes governing ways of working generally. We've picked out these four because these are the ones where there is going to be a difference when you think about things going forward through and after the pandemic. The last bit here, I've talked about exemplars. I'm not going to go into detail here about exemplars. We're just going to talk about some principles that have come up that you might want to think about as you're considering your new ways of working. And because, like I said, nobody in the sector knows everything about these new ways of working yet, we are going to put you into breakout groups just for 20 minutes or so for you to engage with each other and share good practice. So I hope that sounds Sounds good for everybody. And um, yeah, we'll, we look forward to hearing your views and seeing your views in the chat. So um, let's go on then. So I'm going to call in my colleague Debbie now, who is going to talk about some research that she did in the sector recently. Okay, thank you, Fola, and good morning, everybody. Lovely to see so many join us today, um, and some of the people who actually helped me with the research, and the big particular thanks to those who were involved in the research. So I did a piece of research for a, uh, for a university, and this, this research was undertaken uh, in the late summer, early autumn of last year. And just to say, I'm, I'm Debbie England. I've been an associate consultant with SUMS for about 18 months. And previously, I've got a background of HR in both the higher education sector and the financial services sector. So as I say, this research was undertaken a little while ago, a few, few months ago. And, and as Fola's already indicated, it was very much a, the, the sort of 
uh, practice in this area is very, very much work in progress. And a lot of those organisations that I spoke to weren't 100 percent sure where they were going and felt that probably it was going to be quite an iterative process over quite a significant period. However, I, I did uh, manage to talk to sort of over 20 organisations, both in the sector and outside of the sector, to understand where they thought they were going in terms of post-pandemic ways of working. Obviously, this research was pre-Omicron, so a lot of people thought that they were going to be putting their new arrangements in in the late autumn, or certainly at the very beginning of the new of this new year. And of course, that hasn't quite happened. So it just just shows you very much kind of how uh, challenging this particular agenda is. Um, so, what I would stress with the little table on the right hand side is, I did come to a conclusion that there were two broad churches of approach to um, post-pandemic ways of working. However, it is a spectrum, so it's not it's not an absolute that you know there's a, a, an absolute definition of a centrally defined model and there's an absolute definition of a local and flexible ways of working there is a spectrum but there were these two broad broad approaches and it's not and sort of the organizations i found there was almost a sort of 50 50 split in terms of organizations that were going to centrally centrally defined and local ways of working and in terms of the the um the outside sector organisations, this was large government departments, energy companies, transport organisations, financial services organisations, quite a wide range of professional services organisations that I was able to interview to understand um, where they were going. So in terms of what I mean by essentially defined is that the app you know there's quite a lot of prescription about how ways of working are going to work beyond the pandemic. That, that doesn't mean to say that they weren't looking at uh, people working from home and working on a hybrid basis, but they were actually sort of saying that, um, um, you know, they were just describing it at a central level, whereas local, it was very much, it was up to local managers, local team leaders to decide what it was going to look like. But in terms of the drivers for a central approach for hybrid working, there were some, there were some common features in those organisations. There was a real acknowledgement that the organisation's performance and its service hadn't been optimal during the pandemic, and they clearly wanted to address that. There were big, big concerns about um, creating multiple or split cultures within their organisations between those who had to be on site, particularly they're talking of, particularly talk, think of one utility organisation that absolutely did not want to create um, a, a split between those who had to go out into uh, service pe uh, in, in, in people's homes and their head office staff. Equally, there were concerns about age and gender split with potentially, you know, sort of stereotypes of, you know, women working at home or older people working at home and younger coming into the office and men coming into the office, etc. Real, real concerns about that. Um, Many of these organisations that were which were going for a more central, centrally defined approach, requiring people to come back into the office quite a lot of the time, has felt that they had got little short to medium term opportunity to repurpose, reconfigure or dispose of their office space and they wanted to use it. Some were, were big employers in a particular location were, and were worried about um, the effect on the economy of people not coming into those into those locations. Some, and this is certainly included, some of the universities had done recent significant investments in new spaces and wanted to see them really working for them. There was concern about the well-being of remote workers and the extent to which they'd been able to support them uh, during the pandemic. So that feeling of isolation and concerns about sort of health and safety risks and display screen equipment, um, concerns about um, desk sharing, etc. And they wanted to avoid, um, uh, you know, um, duplication of, of costs. They just didn't have perhaps the capital to provide people with a good workstation, both at home and at work. So for drivers for um, uh, for the local approach were much more around the fact that organisation performance had actually been enhanced. Some organisations had managed to reach a much wider customer base by virtue of, of, of hybrid and remote working. 
they had they were organizations which were fortunate enough to be able to repurpose and reconfigure their space one organization i spoke to a yard, large utility organization had managed to dispose of a 1500 seat um, a head office facility and had bought a small 200 seat uh, 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 office space on a business park so huge potential saving there um, it, for some organisers, it, it, it hybrid working enabled them to address pre-pandemic um, office space shortages. They wanted to address the, the staff's concerns about travel and uh, particularly into city centres, which I think may persist beyond the pandemic. There was a desire to deliver staff expectations in terms of you know their ability to for work-life balance, making their own decisions about where and when they worked. These were very often organisations who already had excellent technology in place to really enable remote working. So the records were accessible, uh, people, processes were, were could be self-served. And they really wanted the opportunity to build on the ability to reduce si silos, democratise their workforce. And what I meant by that is that you know, you're seeing the CEO in their living room rather than seeing their CEO on a platform somewhere, that people were sort of much more equal in that environment and just generally improve engagement because people could all you know, join into a conversation without complex meeting arrangements. Many felt it was a real opportunity to attract more diverse talent. They had a limited talent pool in their local area and they could broaden that out. And they had a culture that really enabled diverse working practice. So they, they, they weren't concerned that they were going to have trade unions coming in and complaining about fairness, etc. If we can move on to the next slide. So yeah so hybrid working principles at a local level so at the local level it, it was very much you know, confirming that local managers and teams can work develop their own ways of working as long as service isn't in any way negatively impacted um, there's very very high level guidance on the types of work and tasks that needed to be done synchronously and on site it required local managers and staff to take ownership of those considerations so they weren't going to be able to go to HR or health and safety or etc. Um, they could make those decisions locally. Uh, there was an expect expectation of regular review. As I said earlier, people weren't 100 percent sure what was going to work. So very much an iterative process. And basically any working pattern could, could be considered, but some, some elements of on-site working were expected to facilitate team development. And these organisations were also developing protocols um, to, innate, to ensure that there was a, you know, that the hybrid working, asynchronous working really worked. So, you know, how was it, what was the expectation of dealing with email, et cetera, outside of hours? If we can move on again. And those that had gone for, for the local principles also had really, really worked on their end to end processes and associated technology to make it easy to work anywhere. Office space, there's huge efforts in terms of developing office space to enable collaboration. But there were concerns around health and safety constraints there. So actually, and I, th and I think, again, they may persist beyond the pandemic in terms of are people really going to be willing to hop desk and drop into a desk that's just been used by somebody else an hour earlier? I think that's something that needs to be considered. And they really focused on staff engagement for parts of the workforce that have to be on site. So for those parts, so, you know, what other alternative flexible working arrangements could be offered? Could they offer priority parking? Could they offer enhanced technology provision to those who actually have to uh, be face to face with their customer and on site? And of course, there was a significant focus on leadership development and management of those key stakeholder groups like trade unions so that you they weren't going to get into a situation where we're sort of dealing with it's not fair that X departments is working off site and Y department has to be on site. So a lot of real effort in terms of that type of engagement. I think that is everything from me. So if we move on back to Fola. It is. Thank you very much, Debbie. So that was a real whistle stop tour of oh, a lot of research that that's a really quick mm -hmm. summary, actually. Um, I was just looking in the chat while Debbie was talking and there's there's a long comment here from Chris. OK, that Marianne has agreed with. 
But yes, uh, what I saw here, very much around hearts and minds. So yeah, quite straightforward to return to work. But like you've said there, I mean, it's a really long comment, which I'm sure people will agree with. Um, what we want to do now, very quickly, before we move on, is just to take a little poll. So you've seen what Debbie has said about the, and like she rightly said, it is on a spectrum, but she has looked at the, the ends of the spectrum, the polar opposites, as it were. And I'm just going to launch a very quick poll now to ask, where are you all? So where do you think your universities are? So I'm just going to click launch and hopefully you should see that pop up on your screen. So I've got flexible, okay, it's changing a lot, mixed and unclear, central, okay, lots of flexible coming up. That's an interesting. I'll leave it to run for a little while. Yeah, we're almost there in terms of percentage. Um, almost there. Do you want a few more seconds while you ponder? Okay, I'm going to end the poll now. End in the poll, everybody, last chance. And let's share the results. Okay, what does this tell us, everyone? That this is it. This is interesting, Debbie, isn't it? I'm yeah, honest. I think <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it looks like it's moved on quite a bit because certainly when I was talking to people, there were quite a lot who were developing quite significantly centralised guidance and had quite an expectation of people being, you know, back into the office at least 50% of the time. And, you know, you know, teams had to have cover in every day. And, you know, there was perhaps some organisation, particularly, particularly in professional services organisations, where they there was going to be one day a week when everybody had to be in. So you had that, you know, sort of forced collaboration, if you like. So it's quite interesting. It's, quite a low percentage have put that but if some some of the mixed or unclear might might be ones that I would have put probably defined in the central box yeah yeah, yeah. no brilliant thank you for taking part in that everyone and that's really great um so I've stopped sharing now and I'll just take that down and see whether anything else has come in the chat as you go through so um okay central but flex around the guidelines so I can see this is where some of those mixed things are coming in aren't they brilliant stuff well done thank you for taking part in that so we're just going to move on and um I am going to move on to my colleague Emma, who you might have seen her thought piece, a really interesting thought piece. If you haven't, please go and look at it. It's on the SUMS website. A little bit of a plug there for you, Emma. But off you go around human resources. Thanks, Fola. And, and hi, everyone. Lovely to, to virtually see some of you this morning. Um, my name's Emma Ogden. I'm one of the consultants at SUMS Group. Um, and prior to that, I've only been at SUMS for a couple of months, but prior to that, have worked in HR roles across the sector and outside of the sector as well. So um, hopefully get an opportunity to speak with some of you, many of you, hopefully, in the not too distant future. So as um, followers intimated, I did do a thought piece back in uh, just over a month ago, which was about what to expect in employment law uh, in 2022. Thank you, Marion, for putting it in the chat. Um, that just basically outlines some of the legislative and regulatory changes that are, that are expected next year. Um, I'm not going to go through that in, in great level of detail this morning, but what I want to do is pick out some of the key highlights, which I think are really pre prevalent for thinking about post-pandemic ways of working. So you can see from the slide, I've got four elements that I want to talk through. Um, I have just got this one slide, so I'm going to do lots of talking. I apologise in advance, but by all means, jump in, ask any questions in the chat. And Deb, Debbie and Fola are very going to, kindly going to monitor that for me and, and jump in and interrupt me if I'm just waffling away and missing any, any of your asking. So forgive me now. Um, and I'm just going to kind of kickstart and go through some of those things. But by all means, ask any questions at any point. So... The first element I want to talk about is flexible working. Um, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with flexible working, either through yourself having made requests or as managers dealing with requests. Um, flexible working is possibly going to change. So there has been some government consultation on making flexible working a day one right. That consultation ended on the 1st of December last year. We are still waiting a further update on that. 
Um, the current provision for flexible working is that's available for employees with um, any employee, but with 26 weeks service. Um, as I've mentioned already, one of the, the elements of the consultation was to make that a day one right. So that's a possible change that could be happening. Other elements included within that consultation um, include limiting the reasons that employers can use to refuse a request. So currently there are eight legal business reasons which can be used to refuse a request. That may be sought to be changed. The other element is um, an obligation on employers that if, an, if a request cannot be accommodated, that the employee, the employee has to make alternative arrangements or consider what alternative arrangements may exist. So at the moment, an employee can just say no, and as long as it's aligned to one of those business reasons, that's sufficient. Um, but there might be more need to have a, engage in a more proactive conversation about how that flexible working request could be accommodated. So we are exploring flexible working under a number of caveats throughout this webinar. Um, and I think it's really important to reinforce as a, as a theme to this, that what we have previously identified as a really traditional form of flexible working. So thinking about things such as like part time and um, term time, having shorter lunch breaks, earlier finishes, things like that are changing and they're going to become a lot more agile in terms of maybe thinking about types of work, ways of work, location of work, method of work. It isn't just those traditional methods that have existed in the past. So I think having as proactive a conversation with employees around cultural mind, mindsets, what flexibility really looks and feels like, um, would be really beneficial to, to start engaging in. And I think another tool that's really supporting that is something like a workforce plan. So you can look as an employer holistically across your entire workforce, not just looking at key groups or individuals who are making these requests or asking some of these questions. The next point I want to talk about is harassment. Um, harassment obviously can take many forms um, and how to effectively navigate and appropriately manage harassment is a topic that I could talk through for a significant amount of time. Um, but for the purposes of this webinar, I just wanted to touch briefly on sexual harassment as that's an area again, that might um, in be introducing some possible legislation in the next year. So sexual misconduct has held attention um, quite considerably over the past few years. So thinking about the Me Too campaign, also thinking about anonymous testimonies that were invited to be submitted via Everyone's Invited, of which I think 119 universities were named as part of that process. Um, it also seems that harassment and sexual harassment was exacerbated during the lockdown period. So um, a study that was carried out by the charity Rights of Women found that a quarter of women who were suffering sexual harassment at work said that misconduct was exacerbated during lockdown. So almost half said that sexual harassment was now taking place remotely. That same study also found that seven in ten people felt that their employer was not doing enough to protect them from harassment. So going back to the legislation and thinking about what that means, the government is looking to introduce a proactive duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. And what that therefore means is that universities would be required to take all reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment from occurring and could be held liable for harassment that was committed also by visitors to the workplace. So again, thinking about as an institution, what policies do you have? How are standards of conduct and behavior communicated? but not just from that baseline perspective, but in terms of how people are working, how people are communicating, where they're located. It isn't just about face-to-face, -face. it can happen in any form, including remotely. So thinking about your training intervention, thinking about catch-ups with your managers, thinking about how your managers are engaging with teams, um, being aware of any arising issues, being very proactive around this space, I think is really key to ensure that you're aligning to any legislation that is brought in by the government looking into this year. The third point I want to touch on very briefly is global mobility. So going back to the kind of the mindset of changing attitudes to flexible working, some of you may be familiar that, they, um, that we've seen increased requests and enhanced opportunities for global mobility. So by that, I mean, location of where people are working and not just limiting that to the UK. So some employees perhaps who's, uh, who don't come from the UK wanting to return to their home country and work from there. We've also seen employees asking for maybe changes to their reward and benefits. So thinking about having access to free flights or discounted flights, extended medical coverage if they are doing more traveling or going um, traveling abroad a bit more 
having further support to hit, to enable them to adhere to any compliance issues. So thinking about tax, immigration, social security, elements like that. Um, I would precursor this and, and touch on Debbie's research that found that not many institutions are supporting this, this form of working just because it requires significant understanding and alignment to regulation and compliance. So there's huge immigration considerations such as right to work. There's obviously the changing travel restrictions, which still seem to be changing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, um, ensuring health and safety of remote working employees, thinking about digital solutions, thinking about different time zones and different elements that employees might be working in, um, thinking about their health and safety as well. So I think managing expectations is really key here. And certainly from my previous roles, I've seen a lot of employees ask these questions, um, wanting to not understanding why it is that they can't work abroad, why they can't do those elements. So I think it's really important as an employer that you think about how you manage expectations in terms of what the role actually needs. Does it need more on campus presence? Does it need, for whatever reason, an employee to be based and agile in the UK? Is there scope for that to be considered in a bit more of a flexible space? Is your legal risk and appetite too great or not too great to support these sorts of questions? But I think being aware that these, these elements are being asked, um, it is a consideration in terms of thinking about recruitment, it is a tool to think about in terms of the diversity of, of the talent pool that might be available, but front loading that with how you effectively manage those expectations I think is really key. And finally, there's um, one last point I want to talk through, and, and you'll be pleased to know that isn't aligned to any legislation. So hopefully it's less of a heavy topic, but I wanted just to talk through some of the changing expectations, demographics and culture that might be existing. And I think, again, really important to reinforce that I think employees' wants, needs and expectations are almost unrecognisable compared to pre-pandemic. And I think some of that's been touched on in the, in the chat in terms of contractual um, requirements versus what an employee wants and needs. Um, culture will be a theme again that runs throughout this discussion and, and Follow will be talking about this at many different points, but I think there's a huge element here to be thinking about in terms of maintaining belonging, um, how to maintain effective employee experience and engagement to enable positive ways of working in the future, irrespective of what that look that may look and feel like. So some of the things to think about within that is how to balance business needs and employee expectations. I think the hybrid working debate, certainly from my perspective, I, I, fe I feel sort of really polarizing views. I think there was at some point there was one camp who very much wanted predominantly home based working. And then you had the other side who wanted predominantly on campus working and, and working in a sort of HR role, navigating some of those changes to expectations was really difficult and supporting managers to have those conversations was really challenging. So coupled with, you've got that side of it, but coupling that with what the actual business wants and needs um, and how you manage those expectations with employees can have a huge impact on engagement and their morale and, and their effective working. I think it's also really important to consider how to maintain a sense of belonging and connection. So employees that are working more remotely or in a more hybrid space need to continue to feel belonged or a part of the institution that they're working for. So again, thinking about effective communication, thinking about new ways to engage with staff so that they don't lose their identification with the workforce is really key. I think how to ensure effective work-life balance is really important. I think there's been a huge blurring of lines between home and work. Um, I think there's been way more examples of presenteeism. I think there's been more increased demands on employee availability and outputs. And I think there's been a much higher increased pace of work. I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea that you have a meeting that finishes a minute before your next one and you don't have time to make a cup of tea before the next one starts. That's almost the working environment and the culture that we're experiencing now. And it's really important that I think strategies are considered on how to navigate this really effectively for all staff. I think how to enhance well-being and mental health support is really important as well. Debbie has touched on this already um, through the research that she did. We know that the pandemic had a significant impact on employee well-being and that has increased an expectation from employees around support and intervention for those who are suffering with poor mental health. 
I think this needs to be a really key area of priority and should be coupled with lots of other initiatives that consider physical health and safety as staff. And that needs to be a holistic well-being offer. It needs to be integrated as part of considering health and safety and almost not as a separate intervention. Final couple of points that I just wanted to make. So um, with different changes of working, some of you may have also heard of the noise of what's being termed the great resignation. So a recent survey has found that I think up to 77% of millennials are actively seeking new roles. And it's also predicting that up to a quarter of employees are going to be changing roles within the next few months. So how you attract and retain your top talent when under that landscape of knowing that there is a chance that turnover is going to be quite high in the next few months is really key to be thinking about. So thinking about your employee value proposition. So by that, the, the employee experience from recruitment, engagement, reward, development, um, all of those elements are really key to thinking about. So skills, um, how are you training staff? How are you adapting to skills shortages? considering increased use of technology, digital revolution, um, thinking about how you invest your talent, how are you assessing who your talent is, where are your talent pipelines, where do capability gaps exist, how are you supporting those. Um, there's got to be a really genuine commitment to reskilling staff as well to help to close some of those talent gaps. And finally, thinking about the changing in the demographic. So final fact for you all, um, it is expected that UK workers are planning to work longer and later in life. The number of active workers aged 65 and over is projected to increase by a third in the next decade. And what that possibly means is that we're going to be managing up to four different generations together in the workplace. So four different generations with four very different mindsets, different expectations, different needs, possible blockages for internal talent pipelines. So I've just talked about how to attract and retain talent, but I'm also saying there might be a blockage for them. So all of those things are really, really difficult to navigate. And I'm, I'm very mindful that I've almost presented a lot of issues here, but it's a really exciting time. And I think the engagement and, and interaction that you have with staff and bringing them on this journey with them and how you're communicating with them is absolutely key. And would be, I would love to have further conversations with anyone who would like to think about any sort of innovative solutions that need to be made to some of these issues. And thinking about it in the context of this broader landscape, I think is absolutely integral. Um, I can see lots of things have popped up in the chat. So hopefully I haven't missed anything um, as part of anything I've been talking about. By, by all means, follow Debbie. I, I think you've been sort of engaging with that as well. But any questions, any thoughts, either happy to take them now or contact me separately away from this webinar. Um, but thank you very much for your time and I'll, I'll hand you back over to Paula. Thanks, Emma. So really lots to cover there. Yes, um, just looking through the chat. Thanks, everybody, for your comments there. Um, clearly, lots of excitement around that expanded talent pool, but recognising some of the challenges that Emma has highlighted. Mm -hmm. So Ali has talked about challenges around training, induction, and just ensuring that you have that inclusive approach. Um, there's an interesting kind of, well, I live this situation already, from um, Lindsay, uh, is that Jane? Yes. So husbands, employers already globally, obviously this was pre-pandemic, but lots of changes. And now they're actually looking at using some of those locations you say for staff retreats, which yeah. is really re-customizing and looking mm. at how they use their, their, their estate, which is one of the points that Debbie mentioned earlier around you know, people saying they're being centrally driven because they've just invested in lots of infrastructure and estates. Well, you know, the repurposing of that is clearly something that can be looked at. So mm. thank you very much, everyone, for the comments coming in. Debbie, anything that you want to highlight from the responses you've been yeah, given? Yeah, I mean, I, when I interviewed companies, that the, the, I mean, I think the global issue is a, is a really exciting one in terms of potential talent pool, but it is it is a, a real challenge. And I, I only found two organisations who uh, were uh, allowing staff to be located overseas mm. And they tended to be multinationals who already had both the, the expertise and the infrastructure mm. to enable that. So overseas payrolls, 
yeah, tax and the national insurance experts, employment law experts, in, in, to, to ensure that you know, um, his, you know, staff had a good experience. I mean, I know there's some HR colleagues on on the call today who've experienced the pain of suddenly finding that they had a member of staff in some unexpected <laughs> location, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly having to sort of pedal like mad to make sure that their sort of tax and national insurance it's, it's arrangements were, were were correct in that in that kind of location. And and in terms of that that you know the talent you know the sort of uk wide talent pool you know absolutely some of the organizations i spoke to were looking to open up their some of their some, some of their opportunities to the whole of the uk but were slightly concerned about letting people be located maybe hundreds of miles from a from the from the main head office because they weren't sure how their hybrid working was going to work mm -hmm. and what, what happens if they actually start to they recruit people and then actually start to realize that they they need to sort of co-locate people more often than they originally anticipated so there so there are some real challenges to be thought through yeah i think also just to touch up just quickly reviewed the chat and just to touch on a theme that i think i think owens made um it, I think it is really important to think about staff and students as a collective group. Mm. I think what we often fall victim of is having sort of sort of academic registry type services thinking very much around student and student experience and then HR type services thinking about staff and staff experience and we look at them as two very distinct groups but having a combined collective co-created consideration of what experience and expectations and needs are I think is really really important and not looking at them as two discrete mm. groups and then there are obviously distinct um, differences mm. that do exist between them but having that as a starting point to think actually how does one impact the other and, and actually how do they how do they work alongside each other is also really important to do as well. Thanks Emma, thanks Debbie. Um, yes, you would have seen me get up there because the sun had changed direction as we were going through the webinar. So I had to go get up and uh, change my curtains. Yeah, benefits of working from home, eh? Um, so I've moved us on. Thank you very much for all the discussion that was coming through. Um, so I've moved us on to talking about culture. Now, um, when you uh, registered for this webinar, um, Marion and Grace gratefully um, included a question to say, which themes are you most interested in talking about? And almost bar none, practically everybody, their first thing was, yeah, let's look at organizational culture. And I think this comes back to quite a few of the things that are already in the chat around, I know Chris has left now, but around hearts and minds, around training and development, around students and staff dynamics, power structures, and things like that. So culture covers a multitude of sins, doesn't it? Um, on this slide, I kind of put together, well, actually, this is not my work, Debbie, this is yours. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a quote from a thought piece that Debbie wrote a little while ago, where she was kind of considering post-pandemic ways of working. And I took this quote from her because this is quite, some of the things that she mentioned in this little quote are actually things that organizations are talking to us about when we go around and you know work with them around, okay, let's look at your new ways of working. They talk about things like inclusivity, well-being, being open and transparent, in, uh, innovation, collaboration, all of those things come together as this is what we want to be, this is the culture that we want to show. So, uh, Debbie, do you want to say anything about that before I, I move on? No, I think you've covered it off well there. <laughs> so, so what I wanted to do, and I don't know how many of you, I know there are lots of people from the change community on this call, so you will be very familiar with the culture where we talk about it all the time, don't we? So uh, just thinking about the culture web a little bit then. So if our central paradigm is essentially what um, the quote was on the last slide, a work culture that is safe, inclusive, open and transparent, collaborative, and so on and so forth, offers good service, staff and students, learning environment, what does that mean? for the elements of the culture web. What kind of stories do we want to tell? So in an online environment, we're probably not going to go all the way through the web, 
um, what we would do, I, I would normally run workshops along these lines and I would ask people specifically to think about all of those elements. I mean, one of them, clearly, the stories people tell covers everything. It covers everything around the web. You can tell stories about anything there. But what kind of stories do people want to be telling if you have a central paradigm that says we are open, transparent, collaborative, innovative, and so on? It would be interesting to see in the chat what kind of stories, and probably later on in your breakout groups, what kind of stories you can think about that demonstrate that your culture is along those flexible lines that you mentioned in the poll earlier. So I would expect stories like, you know, my work-life balance, fantastic, you know, I can work beyond, I, I'm a little bit of a my best work after dark kind of person. Some of my colleagues are crack of dawn kind of people. You know, it's that kind of dynamic we want to see going along here. Power structures, how many levels do you have to get to before you make decisions within the organization? Are there thresholds where you can make your own decisions? That kind of thing. In a post-pandemic way of working, you would expect power structures to be flattened so that people can start making those decisions and delivering outputs without going up 10 layers of bureaucracy. And then the other one that I just wanted to touch on very quickly was internal controls. Is everything paper-based? Do you have to sign? Are there 10 signatures on every you know, expense claim? Things like that. So these are things that in a workshop scenario, you might look at to see, okay, does our paradigm fit exactly what we are saying our culture is going to be? Just because this was such a big topic um, when it came to, you know, people saying that they were interested in this, I really would like to see in the chat what people think about when they think about a post-pandemic work culture. I mean, are those words that I highlighted on the left of these slides, do, do they chime with you? Do you what, what else can you think of? What, what, how would you describe your culture within your organisation? Most of you have said, well, some of you have said mixed, but some of you have said, you know, you, you're taking that flexible approach to post-pandemic ways of working. I think one person earlier talked about a hybrid pilot that was running for a year. Has that helped to change the culture? Has you, have you seen a cultural shift in any way? Would be interesting as we move on just to see whether anything comes up in the chat around that point. Um, Debbie, Emma, anything else to say? I know, Emma, you kind of closed off around culture, didn't you? Anything that you want to add at this point? No, I don't think so. I just think it's really important to acknowledge that that culture, we're really seeing a massive shift in that culture. And I think we were sort of thrust into making very reactive changes, to, well, almost two years ago now. I can't believe it's that long ago, but we're almost now seeing what the long term impact of some of those things have been. And I think, like someone said at the beginning, um, there's the contractual position and then there's the position of what an employee's wants and needs are. And I think we're seeing a real disconnect with that. And I've noticed um, there's been a comment from Lindsay as well in terms of, well, what about student expectations mm -hmm. here? But where's the focus? Are we focusing more on what staff want? Are we focusing more on what students want? And we are, as I've sort of alluded to and touched on, thinking about them as two dis discrete groups. But those two elements form a fundamental part of what an organisation's culture is. So I think it's really important that you take all of those factors and not just see culture as what Thing, one construct and one theme that runs throughout everything but look at all the dynamicism that exists within that and I think Owen's made that point dynamic springs yeah, I, I, there's some in, there's some interesting comments in the chat about some some you know students being quite dissatisfied that the focus has been far too much perhaps on staff and and you know I've certainly when I interviewed eight the eight universities that they were all very very focused on the um on the student and actually you know the people were saying really concerned about isolated campuses you know empty campuses not having that you know not having the right support in place for students and that was very much uh, leading to quite you know you know they were still looking at hybrid working but very much defining that they wanted to make sure that there were people you know in the student services on the campuses every day and they wanted staff to be able to access services on campus every day and so yeah. 
and to, and, to, and to ensure that that was achieved, they put quite centrally defined principles in place. I think um, Ellen as well has made a really good point about saying we need to think about what this isn't. So uh, presenteeism, I completely agree with you, Ellen, I think is a, is, is a risk of becoming a real issue if we don't tackle that. Um, mm. if, if you use Teams, you can see who's available when you're available. Um, you can see mm. that green circle at six o'clock in the evening when people are still working. Some people I know have been thinking, I can't log off because I can see that person is still active and online. Um, you you have you have different mechanisms of communication now, so you don't just have a phone call, a face to face meeting, and an email. You have an email, you have a Teams chat, you have things popping up everywhere. So we do need to start thinking about what negative elements are coming out of these new ways of working, and what interventions do we need to be putting in place to 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 not move to a negative culture and not move to a culture of of ways of working that we don't want to be promoting. Yeah. Yeah, some some in, some interesting points coming up in the chat around, um, you know, you know whether people, you know, one, one department can afford kit and can, you know, there's some sort of un, you know fundamental unfairnesses in the organisation, and I, I, that must extend to students as well. I mean, we we know, you know, some some students may be able to afford all the necessary kit to to operate very effectively remotely, and others potentially not. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, everybody. And thanks once again for all the comments coming through the chat. Really useful um, intel there. So um, hopefully you'll continue that discussion when you get into your breakout groups. Okay, so let's move on quickly. Now, I've titled this slide Equality and Diversity Considerations, but actually it's a little bit more than that. Um, when you think about roles in relation to uh, new ways of working, smart ways of working, whatever we want to call it, you often get these four um, categories, these four definitions of roles. If anyone can think of any other definitions, um, I'd be interested to hear about those in the chat. Um, but you get your, your office-based worker, your hybrid roles, so some elements of the role can take place in the office and some externally, mostly remote, and you have fully remote remote. But I guess the question that comes up here is what issues does this present? And I think Debbie touched on some of these issues earlier on in her section around gender stereotypes re-emerging. Re I think a Debbie proximity bias was one of the things that you were highlighting here, wasn't it? Yeah, can I can I just say something about that last night? Because I, I switched on the news at, and I will literally it takes 60 seconds. So I took it switched on the news at 10 to 10 to 10 last night. And this is the, the news, BBC News Channel. And, it, and this is a, an example in the States, so it's not entirely applicable to the UK. But in the States, in the last month, a million men have returned to the workforce, but only 39,000 women. And the, the news broadcaster, both the UK one and the one based in the States, were saying, well, of course, women have got to look after the children. So they're staying at home and not going. And I, I just, you know, I just really do worry, you know, that how, you know, if this is, is, isn't given really careful attention, that, that how these kind of stereotypical models can could be really reinforced. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anything in the chat around this? So clearly, when we are looking at our new ways of working, post-pandemic ways of working, we need to start thinking about that equality impact. It'll be interesting, I think it's Ali, isn't it, that's running the pilot, if you can pop in the chat or mention in your breakout rooms earlier, later rather, whether you are doing any kind of equality impact assessment as you are going through your pilot because that is one of the things that a pilot enables you to do, mm -hmm. to see what is the impact on different groups. Do we have to, you know, refocus this? And I guess that's the reason why you're running this one year pilot. But e equality impact is, is a big thing. I guess, I guess the one thing I would, did want to touch on here is that when you look at roles in this way, you are perpetuating those inequalities. And I think what we should be doing instead is what we have on the next slide, which is just thinking a little bit more around tasks rather than, okay. Um, Grace, could you take back control and move the slide on for me? Seems to have frozen. Oh, brilliant, thank you. Um, so, um, so on this slide here, we've talked about 
Um, well, well, this is not our model, as you can see, we have given it full um, reference here to Gartner. And Debbie, do you want to come in here? Because this is what we were talking about in terms of enabling collaboration rather than focusing in on roles. Yeah, so it's, uh, this this is a model, you know, which you, you can find this one on, on the internet, but that Gartner have done quite a lot of work in terms of rather than just saying certain roles, you know, we'll, we'll just define them as remote or we'll define them on campus, is actually looking at the absolute nature of the work and determining whether the work needs to be done um, or, ca or can be done uh, on, a, on a sort of remote or distributed basis or really needs to be done on a co-located co and whether it needs to be done um, at the same time or it can be done at sort of I think the term they use asynchronistically so people can 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 do work at they don't need to do the work together and you can then start to design roles to working out which bits need to be done in a co-located co when do you absolutely need to bring people together when is it useful people to work alone but together so that might be the model for when you've got new members of staff you know we, we all know when when you're le you're learning a new job there's so many little questions you just might want to be working some with somebody uh, for a period of time and then there's work that absolutely we all know we can get our heads down and get the job done and it works really well for that work to be done alone and apart so i think it's rather than sort of just sort of saying like these jobs are definitely you know the looking at the traditional job as it currently is is actually fundamentally looking at the role and breaking it down into how what what needs to be done where yeah, yeah. brilliant stuff thank you and there's a long comment here. Okay, the, well, this is looking at um, something from earlier. Uh, we'll, we'll move on a, a little bit. And um, if one of you can look at Graham's comment in the chat, it looks like an interesting one. Um, I want to get us to our breakout groups at some point. Um, so um, moving on. So this um, slide, just this is the final kind of piece of the puzzle in a way around space and technology. So we can't talk about remote working, blended working, agile working without focusing in on space and technology, can we? And this touches on quite a few of the things that we've already discussed today. So Debbie said one of the fundamental drivers, for example, was that, that central model was we have just invested 600 million in all these new buildings what are we going to do with them? So just thinking, I, I've kind of put this into three areas. If you want lots more detail on this, uh, my colleagues Claire Taylor and Nick Skelton have done an awful number of thought pieces around remote working, digital learning, infrastructure, space and the environment. Um, but the things I wanted to touch on here is around making sure that we are investing in the right type of spaces. So those cellular offices, do we really need them? What about open plaid, shared? How do we create that sticky campus that people are talking about in the chat around, you know, students not just seeing, you know, a graveyard? Um, just thinking about all of that, how do we repurpose our infrastructure to enable those spaces to feed in to the ways of working of the future? Um, so that's a key area of focus. Of course, digital learning, uh, interesting, people have been talking about students in the chat a lot. I actually ran some workshops with students yesterday where we were talking about digital strategy and they, they were being consulted on the digital strategy. And the students were saying that the blended approach where uh, the, I think one of them said, you know, I have one course where there are 600 of us in that course and if that one is run remotely online you know that's fine however for seminars and things like that there are about 25 of us and we're on campus and we're collaborating so they recognize that there's that there's a need for in the future some kind of balance between what is delivered online and a clear rationale for that and what is delivered on campus so that they can engage with their colleagues. So lots there around digital learning and students, I mean, students have a, a loads of examples of things that they would like to see. 3D classrooms, you know, rag ratings that show them what they need to do to achieve a 2-1. Like I said, it was really invigorating talking to students yesterday. Um, 
And then the other thing here is around knowledge management and technology. One of the things that you notice, um, and maybe things are moving on, but very much around lots of things in our heads in, in the higher education sector, lots of tacit knowledge. And how do we make sure that within a kind of more hybrid setting, that information is available in a useful format, accessible within a, you know, the right systems and tools to make that happen? So those are the three elements that I have pulled out as being important around space and technology. I'd really be interested to hear in the chat whether anyone has any other areas that they think, you know, are really fundamental here. Clearly, this is a wide area and this actually is where most of the money is spent. So, you know, the senior leaders in our organisations are going to be really keen on keeping an eye on this. Um, I, just that quote at the top, and that is actually is a quote that I got from Nick Skelton's um, thought piece, where he said, modern digital strategy isn't just about doing existing things better, it's about doing new and better things. And that's what the students want us to be thinking about when we are thinking about the digital future for the higher education sector. So yeah, just um, a few thoughts there around space and technology. Anyone have anything that they would like to add in the chat? I am going to move us on and I think I am going to move us on to uh, breakout groups now because like I said I really would like us to have some time to just discuss with each other. So um, if we make how many people do we have? We have about 40. So if we have six breakout rooms let's see yeah so about five six seven of you in a room so what i have done i have put a padlet in the chat if you click on that padlet you will see some questions that i have posed um, it's a very easy tool, just open it in another window um, and it asks you, what are your thoughts around, you know, culture, space and infrastructure, human resources, equality and diversity, what things are you really doing um, that you would like, you know, that you see as best practice? So just, um, I'll give you about, let's say 15 minutes to start off with, and then I'll come into the rooms and see how you're doing. Um, but yeah, just, just so that you're not just listening to us because we all have a lot to learn from this. Um, and I will open up the rooms now. So you should see an invitation, everybody to join your rooms and I'll give you 15 minutes. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had some good discussions there. I saw lots of stuff coming in on the Padlet. So thanks a lot for that. Um, you will be getting these slides and I will also do a download of all the comments on the Padlet as well. So you'll have a full PDF of all of the outputs um, from, from this morning's session. Um, as you're coming in, it was quite interesting, as I was looking at some of the, the comments here, I saw a reference to telephone calls and I said to myself, what are those? <laughs> we, we hardly ever use telephones anymore, do we? It's all Teams and Zoom. So that was an interesting point, just, just a little bit made me smile. Um, okay, I think we should be all back because I closed the rooms down. Yep, yeah, all back now. So just um, some final thoughts then. Um, I, like I said, I'm not getting everybody to feedback from the groups. Thank you for getting stuff onto the Padlet. Um, what we've done here is just a collective, of a jumble of things that we've kind of found out along our travels, which I'm just going to just play out to you. I'll just um, show the, the, the slides now. And some of these might chime with things that you um, were talking about in your, in, your, in your groups. And that's gone too far. 
Okay. So ways of working then, final considerations. I'm so, sure some of these came up in your discussions and we've already talked about global mobility. So residency, travel allowances, things like that. Those are clearly um, points that have come up in discussion and which people are going to be considering as they go forward. There is one comment in the Padlet, which is um, number four here, where we talk about managers. Managers are going to need a lot of support as they take on these new challenges. And that is one thing that we need to be aware of, that managing remote teams is quite different from managing in-person teams. Um, Debbie and Emma, that might be something that you might want to speak to. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, <clears throat> I touched on it slightly before in terms of different expectations, different needs. Um, <clears throat> navigating the legal perspective around things like if there's potential sort of harassment concerns um, and anything around employee relations generally. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just comment that, I mean, certainly all the organisations I spoke to really, really recognise this point about sort of leadership development and, and, and some, mm -hmm. some were kind of working to a quite centrally controlled model until that had really been embedded. So they didn't want to until they felt that their leaders were sufficiently enabled and, and, and trained. They were not they were going to define what had to happen, you know, you know, on a quite a central basis, but recognise that they would want to move to more more devolved leadership decision making about what worked at a, at a local level. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, another point, uh, number six on this list is, um, it's interesting, I think Emma mentioned this in her section where she was talking about, you know, because things are online, people think you can just put meetings back to back. So one minute to get a cup of coffee and then come back to sit at your screen. And we've seen examples of people not having meetings that are 60 minutes or 30 minutes, but essentially 50 minutes and 25 minutes. So they're, they're not kind of focusing on getting onto the hour. That might be that might be mm. some other examples of people doing things like that. Um, anything else on this slide that chimes with anybody that you want to highlight in the chat? Um, I, I'd just add on the meeting etiquette. Some of the organisations I spoke to were really, really formally making sure that there was a bit of uh, sort of general time in a meeting where people could catch up and, you know, create that sense of belonging. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, it, when you are online, it can be so easy just to get into the formal business and you don't get those kind of corridor conversation opportunities. Exactly. Exactly. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. So um, next then. Um, so and a few more final considerations here. So the tools to support flexible working. I saw something on the Padlet about um, the facilities for hybrid working not being um, up to scratch. And I've seen one university that has a number of, they've called them high flex rooms, um, where they are very, you know, they are structured around being able to support that hybrid working, some people in person and some people remote. Mm. And yeah, that university, they, I mean, they've spent a lot of money doing that. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's, there's lots in there in terms of making sure that the tools are fit for that kind of way of working. Debbie, it sounded like you had some thoughts on, on that from your travels as well. Yeah, I mean, certainly my travels, I mean, some organisations absolutely wanted to do that and absolutely recognised that it's not that straightforward in an open plan environment to have lots of people on different teams meetings and wanting, you know, good meeting facilities, plus some broadband challenges as well. You know, lots and lots of people using Teams in a small office space is, is, is a real, it's, I'm not a techie, but I think I understand Teams is very broadband hungry. So if you've got 50 people all in a room trying to use Teams, it's quite, it's actually quite challenging. And another comment in our group is actually that they, people want to do it and they may even have the money to do it, but actually there's global shortages of some of these technologies at the moment. So you actually can't get some technology for love nor money. Yeah, yeah. We also had a really good discussion in our group about actually how expensive that can suddenly become. So having to, it's not just about investing in sort of the physical space, but having to have headsets that noise cancel. So if you're all in a room on various different Teams calls, 
um, you need to have the right kit and infrastructure to mean that you can, you can mobilise that or do you need a webcam for if you're using a computer on site versus the, the laptop that you're using at home? Do you need to bring in more technical infrastructure? So it is quite an expensive when you start thinking about it to enable some of this to actually happen. The cost really does rack up. Yeah. yeah. And the, yeah. the other piece that I've certainly mentioned in in, um, in this research I did was the need to digitalise a lot of records. I think you pointed at, you know, the, you know, the sort of the tacit knowledge and so on that people hold in their heads. But, you know, there's lots of universities and certainly ones I'm, I've am i worked with, you know, who are significant and the records are still paper based. Yeah. And you physically have to and you have to, you know, got to, it's, it's an expensive and a, a large piece of work to digitalise a lot of those records. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. No, thank you for that. Um, just, I, I just saw something in the chat and this just spoke to the point I made about telephone calls. So I want to kind of give a shout out to this comment from Sarah saying we need to become more comfortable in just picking up the phone on Teams to speak to colleagues and not feel pressured to use the video. That's an interesting point. Like I said, we, we seem to have lost all, you know, knowledge of phones at the moment. So thanks, Sarah, for that comment in the chat. Um, we're doing a countdown to the last few. Are there any questions that have arisen from anything that we have said today um, that you just want to in this these last few minutes? Anything that anyone has? I just have this final slide that I wanted to talk to um, while oh, while while you ponder. Yes, Ellen. Ellen just noticed Ellen's got a hand up. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Hi, uh, Ellen. Yes. Hi. Um, I just wondered. So there's an area which I think is changing very much away from the traditional, which is actually about performance management. And um, I'm a bit stuck between um, understanding that trust and pe trust that people are doing their workload is a is a good thing, and not wanting to push on to presenteeism, and then just sort of thinking, do we have any of the tools that we might have previously used to to see? And I and I don't and I'm you know, I, we're no better or worse than anyone else. I'm not even really necessarily talking about those people who, who might be purposefully not working very hard, but actually those people who can fall into trends because they're disengaged or any of those sorts of things, you know, and how much easier it is to think, oh, just 10 more minutes in bed if you're, um, if you're at home than it is any other place. So I just wondered if you had any thoughts about how performance management might need to change um, moving forward or tools or things that people think they might use. Thank you, Ellen. Debbie, can I bring you in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure Emma will have some things to say. I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think most organisations were really trying to move away from sort of a sort of present presenteeism based performance. So, you know, you're, the, you're a good performer if you're always there and you always look busy to much more about um, output related performance management. So actually sort of trust but you know re really well structured objectives with really clear outcomes and and timelines for those outlines and, and i think and in, in sort of to create that sense of engagement in belonging and absolute criticality that you know whereas you know when you're in the office people could have a quick chat anytime it's sort of you know hugely deliberate leadership in terms of regular check-ins to see how people are getting on and how engaged they are so i don't think there's any sort of unfortunately magic bullet maybe things will develop over time but but also i mean uh, critically having sort of online systems that enable sort of performance management and people management in the in its widest sense yeah i don't <coughs> sorry excuse me i've um i'd probably reiterate some of that and think about <coughs> sorry i would precursor this by saying i do actually have covid <laughs> <laughs> all of this stuff. Um, I would start by by looking at um, the ex you can start still with the same expectations of the role. So what is it are you looking from that employee? So as Debbie said, we are trying to move away from maybe presenteeism and, and core hours of work. But equally, there might be some roles that still require that. So it might be that a service needs to be delivered for students between the hours of nine to five. And therefore there is an expectation that an employee is accessible within those core hours. So 
I think start by looking at the role, looking at what the requirements of that role are, which then gives you parameters to say, actually, I do need an employee to be logged on from 9 a.m. and ready to go. And I can see that they're not logged on from 9 a.m. Um, so that might start some of that interrogation and some of those conversations. If it isn't about that and it is a lot more sort of hybrid, flexible, um, there's scope to define inputs, outputs, then absolutely, as Debbie said, that's that for me would be your measure or your metric of performance in terms of what is a reasonable output that is expected um, from that individual within that period of time. Factoring any sort of adjustments that need to be made. So are there sort of um, issues that exist that mean like they've got a school pickup run that you're very aware of, that you're very mindful that they they will do a little bit work, bit of work later on to compensate that. Are you seeing that that's happening? Um, so it's just getting that balance between not sort of bean counting everything that's happening, but using a bit of an overall managerial, managerial judgment to say, am I seeing a reasonable level of output? And also are there comparator roles? Is this a team of a number of individuals where you can see an output of one individual is hugely different to the other one? And maybe just starting some of those exploratory conversations. So don't go straight to there must be an issue you're not performing, but going to I've noticed this, I've seen this, I'm aware of that. Can we talk about, are there anything that is inhibiting your ability to meet those needs, meet those demands? Is there any support that I need to provide? So almost showing a holding a employee, which sometimes is sufficient. Sometimes if they've been sort of sneaking in an extra 10 minute lie-in, um, it's quite a good way of saying, okay, no, you're on to me. I'll, I'll make sure I sort of put my ideas up. So it's maybe starting with that first as well. I think that's really helpful. I think what, what perhaps my organisation has yet to sort of observe in that is is how much, not necessarily more, but the, and maybe the emphasis on that, that that puts on in, the amount of time a line manager needs in order to be able to achieve that in ways that was much more visible if somebody walked through the door and you knew they weren't on time and, and things like that. So, I, it, you know, it's sort of the same job we've always been doing, but I just think that the the ease with which somebody could fall into bad patterns is easier now and then yeah. that puts yeah. more any recognizing the the role of like the work of line management needs to be better thank you it, though. Yeah. no no worries it is significant and i think you're right the time um and and getting that balance between trust and maybe tacit stalking is also a good to navigate yeah. as well but I, I, again it comes back to that real investment in leadership development in it to support mm. whatever your strategy is don't you know don't just assume that leaders will will, will know how to to operate effectively in the new environment and on that note, we, we will close because that is a really nice place to end in terms of leadership development. I will just put one point in there. Um, Emma, thank you very much for joining us in spite of having COVID. I, um, that kind of comes to that point nine on, on the last slide here, doesn't it? In terms of reduction in absenteeism, uh, Emma is with us today because um, she can work from home. But should that really be a metric of success? Success. Shouldn't Emma be in bed? Maybe she should. <laughs> um, but thank you very much, all of you, for joining us. Thank you for all your comments in the chat and for your information on Padlet. This will all be shared with you, and hopefully, some of this information will be useful for you. I didn't share some of the slides, so you will actually see some more information in here that hopefully you can use as you're developing your principles for post pandemic ways of working. So thank you very much, and bye bye. Bye.